Hi everyone, welcome to Bricks Briefs, your weekly dose of all things bricks, served up by me, Clive. Each week we're diving into the hearts of the Bricks nations, bringing you fresh news, insights and happenings that are shaping our world. In this week's episode, we'll be exploring events from the last few days, such as Yemen's National Army, and you probably didn't know, it's called Ansar Allah, and the news from each Bricks countries. So hopefully you enjoy that. Uh, Join us on this enlightening journey as we try to untangle the complexities of international relations, global economics, and the emergence of multipolarity. These briefs will continue to be a stark contrast from mainstream news, a predominantly positive look at the optimistic international initiative that is BRICS. All right, let's get into it. So the first thing we're going to look at uh, which is some pretty new news you would have heard, and it's a constant thing going on these days. Um, check out this tweet from Yemen, and I'll read it. Uh, With the Western conquest led by America and Britain against Yemen and continuing to weave colonial conspiracies and preparing to expand their ongoing aggression against Yemen and their failure to provide protection for Israel in the Red Sea, There is intense work and movement by the Yemeni state, the leader, the people and the national consensus in supporting Palestine and continuing the effective effective and powerful strategic military operations. And what is earth shattering, on the other hand, is a change in the international climate and a change in the balance of power between the East and West, especially in light of the Western outcry on Russia, drowning it in the quagmire of Ukraine and alienating its alliances with China and the rest of the Eastern and BRICS countries. And here with these international and regional developments and what is happening in Gaza and with the stabilisation of the Yemeni military equation in the Red Sea. With This is a translation. With the intersection of regional interests, there is a continuous building and development in international relations between Yemen, Russia, China and the BRICS countries and the exchange of expertise and experiences in various fields. This has a common interest in drowning America, Britain and the West in the swamp of the Red Sea and on the high seas, and is intended for it to sink, disappear and weaken its unilateral polarity. This is not just an analysis. Rather, it is a clearly visible fact and has become a reality, and Yemen is a state that entered into the equation of supporting Palestine, and ably demonstrated the Red Sea equation, which represents a major and strategic equation that has major effects and results in the balance of the harvest and the military, security, political and economic fruits. And Yemen, thanks to God and the virtue of its brave, wise and redeemed leader, and the pride of the nation, was able to achieve this with vigour. That's certainly true and unparalleled pride until the major powers began knocking on their doors, coordinating and building equal relations with them, making arrangements for the foreseeable future, and preparing for the historic defeat of America, Britain and the West, and the collapse of the colonial project and Western hegemony in the region and the world. There you go. And then Pepe pulls in, so we'll we'll hear from Pepe. There may be another five, six new bricks in uh, October, including all of you. Maybe if you don't know, now you know. Yemen. Can you imagine Yemen getting into the bricks? Strong possibility because the Russians love the idea. The Chinese love the idea. The problem, of course, will be to convince Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. This is a, an uphill struggle, I would say, for Russia, China and Iran to convince Saudi and Emirates that you know, we also need Yemen for zillions of strategic reasons. Sarah, can you imagine when, when uh, the people in the Beltway uh, get hold of all these things? They freak out completely. There you go, Pepe Escobar. Uh, I'm not a big fan. I haven't really heard much of, um, of his stuff. But he's pulled up and he's had something to say about it. Um, and I was reported that uh, the Yemen National Army attacked three uh, U.S. and British ships, or U.S. ships, <clears throat> in the Indian Ocean. So not in the Red Sea, 
in the Indian Ocean, quite far away. Um, I'm sure you'll see reports about that if you haven't already. Um, so that's very interesting. And we we here at Think Bricks think that you should decide. So political scientist Andrew Korupko, uh, in this article uh, from the agency South 24 Centre for News and Study, uh, he's written this article about this event and the situation and you know you've seen what yemen you've seen what usa britain and europeans are saying and the issues it's causing with traffic the shipping traffic um so this article is titled why the Houthis twist the truth by claiming to have ties with russia china and BRICS." so russia and china haven't actually said anything about where they support or they don't support yemen and what they're doing uh, it's a fairly sensitive situation. Uh, and Andrew actually covers this in this article very, very well. Um, as a political scientist, he's actually um, detailing not just the analysis, but the actual events. So you can decide for yourself. What do you think is going on? What do you think is the right um, considering this? And uh, I think Andrew's article will help you to do that. Um, so check that out and hopefully that helps you to have uh, an informed opinion. That is something that is very important to have accurate analysis. So the article is titled, Why the Houthis Twist the Truth by Claiming to Have Ties with Russia, China and BRICS. Uh, that was something that came up that Russia and China support uh, Yemen in their actions that they're doing currently. Um, it says here, Houthis are unhappy with Russia and China's lack of stronger support for Gaza and condemnation of coalition bombings in Yemen. The two countries will not risk a conflict with Israel and US-UK to back Hamas and Houthis. So this is, again, you decide, but there's a, a beautiful article that Andrew's taken the time to actually go through the events. Um, I think it's worth your while. So we'll, we'll move on. Uh, this is a, a Think Bricks article and talking about expansion. Uh, so Bricks expansion, EU monitors the rise of a new global force. So it's written a couple of days ago, March 17th, on the Think, Think Bricks substack. Uh, it's very good because what's happening here is the EU, which I'll just, I'll just read, it says... According to a recent briefing by the European Parliamentary Research Service, the expanded BRICS Plus now accounts for a staggering 37.3% of the world's GDP, more than half of the European Union's 14.5% share. This economic might is seen as a potential counterweight to traditional Western dominance in global affairs. So it's significant, and the Europeans are seeing that. So just a little bit more in the article. The European Parliament has stressed the need for further political dialogue with BRICS countries including on an individual basis, so each country. In an exchange of views with European Commission representatives in October 2023, members of the Parliament's Committee on International Trade, INTA, underlined the importance of monitoring the group's expansion, especially considering the potential impact of a BRICS plus currency and the consequences for EU trade policy. So there's, and there's some statistics, definitely subscribe to the Substack. And you can learn more about the expansion of the, the positive solution that BRICS is, in my opinion. All right, let's move on to the next article. I've got lots of great articles here. From I've tried to get articles from each country of BRICS and see what's happening in the last week. We're going at a good rate here. This is it's news about India uh, and on the site Modern Diplomacy, uh, published on March 17, 2024. Oh, I forgot to mention, this is being recorded on the 19th. So, yeah, the title is Exploring Brink's Expansion and India's Role on Global Economic Landscape. So, another interesting article. This is a great site. Very, very good. Uh, I'll just read a little bit here. So, this is actually, this article is in an interview. Now, uh, it's fairly short. It says, in this interview, President of the Indian Business Alliance and founder of the Imperial Tailing Company, Sami Kotwani says, despite those challenges mentioned above, 
I mentioned above um, is the political systems, economic structures, and cultural norms of its member countries. So there's there's challenges. Uh, dis- says despite those challenges mentioned above, there are also many reasons to be optimistic about the prospect for BRICS Plus and the Global South collaboration. Aware of the current evolving geopolitical power dynamics, BRICS Plus possesses the collective strength and unique capacity to address the challenges of diversity and unequal distribution of resources in the Global South. And you see the questions are put to him. So this is the interview Sammy Quatuani. Sorry, this is so. Actually, anyway, I messed that up. That's all right. So this is a this is a, an article about India's considerations, and and the interview here, the president of the Indian Business Alliance. So it's substantial. This is this is things are going on. There's talks. All right, let's continue. So. This is from the Arab News, uh, March 19th, so just today. And the title is, Lula says Putin would not be arrested in 2024, Brazil G20 meeting. So the Brazil will host next year's annual meeting of the G20, composed of the world's top 20 national economies, of which Russia is a member. So I'll just read a little bit. Uh, Brazilian President Louis Lula said on Saturday that Russian leader Vladimir Putin would not be arrested in Brazil if he attends the Group of 20 meeting in Rio de Janeiro next year. Interviewed on the sidelines of the G20 meeting in Delhi by news show First Post, Lula said Putin would be invited to next year's event, adding that he himself planned to attend a BRICS block of developing nations meeting due in Russia before the Rio meeting. Uh, As a quote, I believe that Putin can go easily to Brazil, he said, Lula. Quote, what I can say to you is that if I'm president of Brazil and he comes to Brazil, there's no way he will be arrested, end quote. So that's good. Uh, I'd be surprised if Putin goes. I'd be very surprised, but, you know, he may. Um, So that's, and okay, we'll go on the next one. This is TASS, Russian news agency. So this is very early in the week, 13th of March. And we actually did a video of this um, on the Think Bricks YouTube channel uh, about the raw materials exchange. So it's titled Bricks May Create Raw Materials Exchange, Russian diplomat. Uh, Sergei Ryabakov stressed that he would hardly include cartel methods here because this could have a negative impact on global trade in such goods. So the... The Russian Deputy Foreign Minister, Sergei Rubikov, he's uh, talking about this raw materials exchange, which is very significant, commodities exchange. Um, so I'll just read a little bit here. Uh, there's a quote from him. This shows that BRICS has room to grow, to develop. For example, the creation of a BRICS exchange of raw materials, commodities. Why not? He said, answering a question about regulating prices in key sectors such as energy and agriculture, taking into account the fact that BRICS has both suppliers and consumers. This is very significant, actually, which is why we did a video about it. Um, At the same time, continuing, at the same time, the diplomat stressed that he would hardly include cartel methods here. Quote, because this could have a negative impact. Continuing, on global trade in such goods. And... Quote, let the experts decide. However, harmonization of approaches and stabilization of key commodity markets so that both producers and consumers have relatively greater predictability in this area is one of the revenues, one of the avenues for BRICS. End quote. So it's a very interesting development when we're talking about economics and Russia and the participation of the BRICS countries um, with each other. Because um, obviously economic cooperation is one of the main, the main things that the BRICS are doing together. So let's keep going. Uh, so this is, this is an article from where the BRICS is going to be chairing, uh, sorry, where Russia is chairing the next BRICS summit. Um, and this is a, a website dedicated uh, to that. And so this article is titled... Uh, Russian Minister of Justice meets BRICS ambassadors in Moscow. 
This is March 12th, so a, a day earlier. So it's a bit early. Uh, but this is very important because there's a lot of issues with terrorism and security concerns, right? There's a lot of conflict going on. So it says here, on March 11, Minister of Justice of the Russian Federation, Konstantin Chuchenko, apologies, held a meeting with ambassadors of BRICS countries as part of Russia's chairship of BRICS. So this is, this is another quote from the article. The Minister of Justice also focused on mechanisms for improving the arbitration of investment, noting that international efforts to resolve disputes between investors and the state should be systematic and long-term in nature. So security, integrity. Uh, Russia has already presented a concept for the establishment of an international BRICS arbitration centre. Representatives within BRICS are currently consulting on the possibility of establishing, establishing such an institution, taking into account the difference, differences that exist in the different nations' legal systems. So, again, this is a website that's keeping people up to date on the 2024 BRICS, which is... Uh, BRICS summit, which is being chaired by Russia, in Russia, in Kazan. So it says there, you see, Kazan, 22nd to the 24th of October, 2024. So very, very interesting. See, BRICS is, BRICS is a great subject. This is where you're going you're gonna to find out a lot about different countries rather than very pessimistic mainstream news. Um, all right, let's move on to the next one. Well, Iran. So Iran is another new member of BRICS. It's, I mean, we're getting on, it's March. Uh, we're past the middle of March. It's been a couple of months. Uh, so this is from the Tehran Times. Straight, to, straight truth, they say. Nice. Um, this is a little bit earlier than one week. It says March 10th. But in this article, it's titled BRICS Sets Up Anti-Money Laundering Working Group. So that's that's very important. Um so just a little bit of an excerpt. Um, the, an Iranian official with the Iranian Economy Ministry has confirmed that the BRICS group of emerging economies set up an anti-money laundering council nearly three months ago. I wonder if you heard about that. I didn't. Um, Hadi Kani, head of the Financial Information Center of the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Finance, told RN, IRNA's correspondent on Sunday that the council is composed of chairpersons of departments for money laundering or chiefs of financial investment centers of the member states. The council for combat, combating money laundering has convened three times up to now, he said, noting that the members discussed its secretariat as well as interaction and cooperation to reach objectives regarding the campaign against money laundering and terrorism financing. So that's very positive for, for security. Uh, excellent and they've been doing it for the last three months so I try to keep up with that and you can see if you're if you're uh, watching me uh, you will see the links uh, there um, all right let's move on so well this is Iran again uh, the international affairs so this is a site it looks like a Russian site actually um, called the International Affairs. This is a post from the 15th of March um, titled Iran joins international information exchange with Russia and other BRICS countries. So this is very positive because when you have communications going between countries then you can cooperate. If it's stifled or people are interfering with it or censoring it or like you have with uh, Russia Today news channel where it's being uh, censored in many countries and you you know censored on YouTube um, obviously communications are, are, are very important for dialogue um, so just a little bit of a quote here the largest state media of the Islamic Republic of Iran which joined BRICS in 2024 confirmed their intentions to join the information exchange with the member countries of the association IRNA Iran's news agency and Mir Media Group which publishes the Tehran Times which was the previous article, um, a popular newspaper in Iran and owns the Mayor News Agency, have signed cooperation agreements with the TV BRICS International Network. TV BRICS, I 
we've referenced them quite a few times, very popular, uh, especially on the topic of BRICS. <laughs> the agreements reached will allow Iran's audience to read the most up-to-date and objective information about the activities of Russia and other BRICS countries in the humanitarian and economic spheres. In turn, TV BRICS will also adapt materials from its colleagues in Tehran into foreign languages and distribute them through its partner network, which already includes more than 60 media outlets from 17 countries. So yes, which I didn't mention, different languages. So it's, that's a, another very positive cooperation form of cooperation. So media, communications, um, and they're cooperating. It's that's cool. That's very cool. Okay, let's keep going. Try to go through these pretty quickly. Uh, so this is uh, an article from TV Bricks on the seventeenth. So just a couple of days ago, titled "Russian Embassy to Attract Investors to e Investors to Ethiopia." As you know, Ethiopia is one of the uh, members of Bricks that has just recently joined on the first of January, twenty twenty four. So it's a little bit about Ethiopia for you. Uh, I'll just read a little bit from here. The Russian ambassador to Ethiopia, Evgeny Terekin, said the diplomatic institution is actively working to enable Russian investors to invest in industrial parks and free trade zones managed by the Industrial Parks Development Corporation. Uh, Terekin said this during a meeting with IPDC CEO Aklilu Tades on ways to strengthen investment cooperation between the two countries. He noted that the diplomatic staff urged Moscow companies to utilize the opportunities in Adi Ababa and invest in industrial parks, and said a delegation of his country's business community would soon visit the African nation as part of pre-investment interaction. So th this was reported by President Latina, a partner of TV Bricks. So this is an article about, about China, Egypt. So Egypt, another one of the newest members this is published an article in the Daily News uh, back on the 13th, so a little while back. Um, but it's, the title is Egypt, China Discuss Prospects for New Chinese Industrial City. So Egypt and China. I think this is very exciting um, because it's about development. Development, and the quote from me, Egypt's Minister of Trade and Industry, Ahmed Samir, recently met with Zhang Tao, the acting Chinese ambassador to Cairo, Cairo, along with a delegation, to discuss the progress made since last week's meeting with the Chinese minister in Cairo. The talks focused on establishing a Chinese industrial zone along the Mediterranean Sea to serve both the local market and exports to European and American markets. I'll continue. Minister Samir announced that a delegation comprising representatives from the ministry the Federation of Chambers of Commerce and the Federation of Egyptian Industries will travel to Beijing next week. The visit aims to engage with Chinese officials and promote the industrial zone, while also exploring investment opportunities. Samir emphasised that the opening of this zone, following the completion of the agreement, will, make, will mark Egypt's first achievement as a member of BRICS. It is expected to attract significant investments to the Egyptian market shortly. So they sound very confident, which they should be. China being a very strong uh, manufacturing and industrial country now. Uh, and they're joining an industrial city, so you have development in a particular spot, in a particular area, and then you have, which is synonymous, as you've seen with the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, development corridors. Um, usually it's the corridor, and then we have particular locations that are uh, industrial centers and they grow um, but this is this is what you do this is actually normal normal activities by countries developing and improving the standard of living for people so that's very positive go Egypt so the UAE so this is f an article on the China daily dot com dot CN uh, I probably call it China daily uh, so this is from the 12th of March, uh, and it's titled, Dubai Commodity Center Attracts More Chinese Firms. <laughs> As you know, Dubai, I'm sure everyone knows, Dubai is very uh, finance-oriented. So I'll just read a little bit here. This is 
interesting. An increasing number of Chinese member companies have settled down at the Dubai Multi Commodity Center, the largest free zone in the United Arab Emirates and of the Government of Dubai Authority on Commodities, Trade and Enterprise, according to senior executives. Uh, the centre is looking to welcome more Chinese firms seeking global expansion. The executive said during a roadshow in Shanghai on March 1st, so just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, a little bit further, last year the DMCC saw eight, 852 Chinese companies registered with the free zone. That's a lot. A growth of 25% year on year. Among them were major industry players Ortel Robotics and Hybei Logistics Group Metals, Metal Materials, according to the center. The latest figures reveal that the DMCC is now home to over 14% of the estimated 6,000 Chinese businesses based in the UAE. There you go. If you didn't know, you do now. That's there's a booming. 25% more than last year. Um, yeah, that's that's great news. So that's Dubai. That's the UAE. Uh, it's an article uh, about growth in one of the BRICS countries, the new, uh, new members of BRICS. So let's go to the next one. Uh, so South Africa. Okay. So there's been a little bit of controversy here. It's, you know, it's elections. That's what's going to happen. Um, but this is an article uh, by VOA. I'm not familiar with this. I'm, I'm not from South Africa. I'm from Australia. Uh, so begging, begging your pardon. But it's an article from March 14th, so not long ago. Uh, the title, Political Spat Brews Over the South African Opposition's Appeal to US. Uh, I mean, I can see why they're worried. So if you just, I'll read here. South Africa's president has slammed a request by the country's main opposition party <laughs> that the US help monitor upcoming elections. <laughs> the governing party says the request is misguided given issues with the, with, quote, the West's own polls, which we've had heard too much about over the last few years. Uh, continuing, a letter by South Africa's leading opposition party, the Democratic Alliance, or DA, to US Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Blinken and the other Western governments, other Western governments, asking for help monitoring South Africa's May 29 election, caused a political furor this week, <laughs> I'll say. Uh, South Africa is well regarded as having held free and fair polls in the past, but the DA's letter asked for foreign help to safeguard, quote, safeguard the integrity of what it notes will be, <laughs> quote, the most crucial election in 30 years of democracy. So, yeah, the president is not happy about that. Uh, understandably, you know, without... I don't want to assert, but, you know, obviously you want to have independence. You know, we have the UN uh, election uh, monitors, supervisors that come, which is, I think that's reasonable. You know, there's someone that's neutral, they come, they have a look, and they report. That's great. But we know about NGOs and that uh, are paid, they have very big money that buys people's uh, activity. I won't go too far, but just to say. So, you know, still on South Africa, there's a, another article by the Zimbabwe Mail. I, I'm trying to bring you um, articles from the countries, you know, not necessarily. In some of these countries, these agencies, these articles are mainstream, um, but they're not Western mainstream, um, who, again, as we know very well, has been documented. If you didn't know, it's been documented that we had intelligence agencies infiltrate um, journalists uh, or media agencies pretending to be journalists and then publishing. Um, but, I mean, we also have the issue of very large corporations with their own very large, powerful interests owning media companies, right? So they sit on boards, they make particular decisions, who will be hired, who will not be hired uh, as part of that because everyone talks to each other in a business, right? Um, and they're private businesses. So this is something to be concerned about. Um, we want countries, and we're talking about BRICS countries, who, are, who have a very sensitive position now because they're trying to 
uh, assert their independence and they're trying to cooperate with other countries that uh, just want to prosper and develop and take care of their people. So elections are a part of that because the citizens participate in the electoral in the electoral process and they participate in the political process in the civic process and interfering in that is is um, affects the outcomes of the very nature of the culture in that country um, the leaders leadership is very important so I won't keep babbling um, so this is just another article and I thought it was there's a lot of adverts on this one, but I thought it was interesting. Just a little bit more. So it says here, South Africa's ruling African National Congress, ANC party, is betting on retaining its parliamentary majority in a May election and is not in talks with other parties on a possible coalition government, the party's Deputy Secretary General said. So surveys show that the ANC is likely to lose its parliamentary majority for the first time since Nelson Mandela led it to power at the fall of apartheid 30 years ago. This would open up the, per the prospect of coalition rule. So you can see this is a bit of an issue for them because then, then there's the leading party, the ruling party, will not be able to rule outright and will have to have a coalition with another party who as other interests, different interests, and I have to compromise, that takes time. So it is significant, and that's South Africa. So, but I, I wanted to share a couple of uh, positive news at the end of this, uh, this broadcast. Uh, this is another article from South Africa um, uh, by TV Bricks uh, on, on the 15th, so just a few days ago, and it's titled, South Africa and Zimbabwe sign agreement on water resources cooperation so that's really positive right so water is really important not but just because in in a lot of uh, areas africa is dry but it's just a positive development and that's that's what we want we want to be optimistic we want the children to be confident that they have a future so they try their best they have some pride and they take care of themselves, they become competent, they become educated. This is all part of that process. Uh, so I'll just for a little bit, South Africa's Minister of Water and Sanitation, Senzo Chuno, Chuno and his Zimbabwean counterpart, Anxios Jongwi Masuka, have signed a memorandum of understanding on the transfer of treated water across the common border. Cooperation. The implementation of the bilateral agreement provides for the delivery of about 15 million cubic metres of water per year, equivalent to 41 million cubic metres per day from the Beat Bridge water treatment plant in the Republic of Zimbabwe to Musina in South Africa. So that's, that's really good. Cooperation, development and uh, water, essential. All right, let's... So the last article, uh, again, from TV Bricks, right? So it's Bricks. Um, this was just from yesterday. Um, so Bricks in Space. I can't help it. I like space. And it's a very positive subject. Uh, exploration, development, technology, science. Um, achieving very steep, hard goals. And actually, and then achieving them and the results from that. What do we learn from that? So space is really important. So this article is titled, <clears throat> Exhibition dedicated to first cosmonaut, Yuri Gagarin, opens in Russian capital. So if you didn't know, Yuri was the first cosmonaut, which is pretty cool. An exhibition dedicated to the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, opened at the Museum of Cosmonautics in the Russian capital. That would be Moscow. The event was timed to coincide with the cosmonaut's anniversary. He would have turned 90 on March 9th. Old man. Among the exhibits, Gagarin, The Road to Space. There are both previously displayed items and those presented to the public for the first time. Oh, For example, the cosmonaut's uniform and briefcase. Next to them you can see a helmet, gloves, certificates, diplomas, education documents and other things that help to get in touch with the spirit of the time and the personality of Yuri Gagarin. 
this is it's quite an achievement so this is the f the first time achieving orbit around the earth in space and he was the first astronaut there's a quite his family and must be very proud um well that's the last one we've got for you so thank you for tuning into bricks briefs if you've enjoyed this dive into the multipolar world and wish to join the conversation please drop a comment if you liked it give it a thumbs up if you think your contacts or colleagues would find value in it please share we would like to receive your feedback and any suggestions really your engagement is important to us don't forget to subscribe for more weekly insights and follow us on our Substack and social media platforms, all linked below. If you'd like to support our work, consider contributing with a buy me a coffee. Your generosity keeps the content flowing. Stay curious, stay connected, stay optimistic, and let's keep exploring together. Ciao.